Tired. So tired. Overtired. What? The feed's been updated? You're listening to Overtired. I'm Christina Warren, joined as always by Jeff Severance Gunzel and Brett Terpstra. Guys, hello. Hi. As, as always, sometimes, as sometimes, all three of us are here. Well, look, I mean, it, it, it's like, let's just, let's just focus on the fact that, again, like I said, the feed's been updated. Like, we're, <laughs> we've got a new episode out. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, the, the plan is to have new episodes for a few weeks in a row here if we, if we stick to plan. We have sponsors, and it would be more trouble to not do the episode <laughs> than to do the episode. So, Thanks. yeah, Christina, how are you? Pretty good. Pretty good. Um, I um, had, kind of, I, well, I mean, I'm, I'm fine now. I slept a lot, which was good. But yesterday, which was, we're recording this on a Saturday. Um, I, on a Friday, which was our normal record date, I would have been a lot more tired if we recorded then because I was in um, San Francisco as an in and out, like on Thursday. Like I flew in at, in the morning and then flew out in the afternoon. And, um, I don't know, uh, be like spending more time in airports than you spend in the city that you're visiting. That's the worst. In the same day. That kind of sucks, to be honest. It so totally it sucks. Um, it was a great trip and I'm really glad that I did it. And it wasn't like that bad, but it's also one of those things where it's like, it's just a not a long enough flight for the whole thing to just be like, okay, in the future, if I can, I mean, in their instances, this was one of them where like, you have to do that. And, and I'm, I'm glad that I was at least close enough to do it, but you're also kind of like, yeah this this sucks like i'm now more tired than i would have been if i had just you know gone someplace and stayed the night and then flown back right right i know i hate that i hate that that i'm always wrong when i make the calls i don't like traveling anymore though is my problem that much i like traveling uh on a vacation i do not like traveling for work anymore which i think is a great segue into a mental health corner yeah i think so mm. travel travel and mental health I, um, tomorrow or Monday, I leave as, as this podcast is released, I will be on a plane to Las Vegas and it's the first time I've traveled. I, we did a road trip this summer, but it's the first time I've like flown for work anywhere in years. And Vegas is not my first choice for places <laughs> to be. Um, but I will be flying in for a few days in Las Vegas for Oracle Cloud World. Yeah, I was going to um, say this for Oracle World. Hell yeah. And I'm presenting on topics that I only know about because I researched them last week. Um, and I have to give, well, actually, like I kind of, I got out of doing most of the, like leading the presentations, but I have to be there for support and live lab instruction and everything, which it's a little stressful. I'm a little stressed out. And like this week I stopped sleeping again. Um, not on purpose. I, I might be manic hard to say because like during the day I'm pretty level headed. Um, but I do tend to get up at four in the morning and start like working on code, which is kind of manic behavior for me. Um, but I figured out, so like I take, three 600 milligram pills of gabapentin every night. Mm -hmm. And it's the only way that I sleep. But then even with that, I started waking up at 2 a.m. every morning, which is, you know, not, not great. And I couldn't no. fall back asleep. So what I figured out was I could take two of those pills at bedtime because I don't generally have trouble falling asleep. I have trouble staying asleep. So I take two of those pills. And that gets me through till 2 a.m. Then I take the third pill at 2 a.m., which gets me through until like 5 a.m., which is a reasonable time to get up because I've been going to bed at like 8.30, oh, which is going to suck in Vegas because my flight gets in at like 11 p.m. on Monday. And then all of our all of our team meals and everything are at like 9.45 p.m. Um, Vegas time, which I think is West Coast. Hours behind. Is, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's two hours behind you. So, so, um, like what, whatever, like, so if you uh, land, so it'll be the equivalent of like 11 PM for you. Yeah. That's uh, nuts. I, yeah, I can't, <laughs> I can't function that late. Um, but I guess I'll have to, I guess this is a good time to get back into like crystal meth. 
Um, no. I mean, yeah, it's that's an individual decision. <laughs> Insult your doctor. Um, oh man, yeah. that reminds me. I'm gonna Go flag something. It. I'm gonna flag something for after the corner. Uh, a meth story. Well, that's that's my corner. I'm I'm stressed about travel. It's not going to be a big deal. I always pull this shit off, no problem. Um, but I just want to I want to I want to jump onto one thing you one part of a sentence you said, which is, um, is that crystal meth. Which no, which is dot dot dot. It's going to suck in Vegas. Everything sucks in Vegas. Yeah, yeah. Except you know what? Except, and I I resisted this so hard when my mother in law booked us to do this. Except the Blue Man Group. Yeah, no, I love the Blue Man Group. Kind of great. I love uh, Celine Dion too. I was gonna say if you can do the shows, right? Like I had right. a I had an amazing time when I took my mom to Vegas. Like I had like Penn and the Teller. Best. Oh, because um, you saw? Didn't you see like we saw, Taylor we saw Swift Adele. in Vegas? No, well, no, we saw yeah, Taylor Swift shit. in Atlanta, but no, we saw Adele mm. in Vegas. We saw Adele oh, right, at, right, right. At, at at Caesars, and we saw um uh the uh the Beatles uh, Cirque show, which now that they've raised um the um um the that um um hotel um because it's gonna become like the hard rock or whatever like that's that's probably not ever coming back so i was really glad we got to see that but we we like went shopping like we it, it's vegas doesn't suck unless you're there for work when you're there for work yeah. it sucks <laughs> right like yeah. but 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 that's how most of us go at this point and well it uh, was it's like ces with like the engadget crew yeah. Was always fun. Like we had well, time for you. for, you know, karaoke and well, for shows you. and yeah. Well, for you. If you if you were if you were a reporter at Engadget, it was not fun, I guarantee you. Um, okay, no, I'll take no, it for it. I will guarantee you it's not fun because you literally have to be on like the entire time. You have to wake up at six AM to go to press conferences and you have to also go to dinners with people. And yes, you have time to do team excursions, but that also means that you again have to then go out to like parties that companies are having and schmooze and then get up at 6 a.m. and you have to blog five or six things a day. Like it sucks. Like oh, you're like, blogging like, five or six and, things a day. And while you're walking around- I hated around the early 2000s. The, <laughs> while you're walking around the entire convention center and then at CES at that point was so big that it was too big for the convention center. So you'd have to go from like one thing to another, like. Um, it's maybe fun once, but if if you're actually going to those things to work at like as a writer, no. See, yes. Are there sucks. still? Here's a question, and Christina, you might have the the best sense of this. Are are there still jobs in journalism where you are expected, like real jobs in journalism, we are expected to blog five or six times a day? That much, probably not. Um, Isn't that but- nice? I think we should. Yeah, it is. It, it it is. Except, but but it's funny because like the one exception are like the big event days, right? So like things like CES mm, or yeah. World Congress or the Apple, you know, news days. That's an all hands on deck thing to this day, where you will have multiple people who will be contributing. And um, yeah, I mean, but no, it's no longer the even the business insiders of the world and whatnot like that. Like they're not asking people to blog that much. Um, I think that it's it's probably uh, more um, reasonably um, gone to like a, a file once a day thing, which is much better. Um, yeah. And 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 with BuzzFeed and all those things being gone, like you don't even have like the quick like listicle sort of shit. Um, like the closest thing you know to that that's still around, I guess. Like I said, would be like Business Insider, and I think they're probably even for their interns, they're probably only like at a, a file once a day place. So that's yeah. good. Yeah. At the same time, I will say as like bad as that was. That was like the best boot camp I ever had as a writer mm. mm-hmm. was was having to file a lot about a lot of different things. I mean, like you get burnout for fucking real, but yeah. you also get fast. And when there's breaking news, like no one is faster than a blogger. Like What I always liked, I, I liked a version of this, which is I'm thinking, ex- so I covered the RNC when it was here in St. Paul was the McCain Palin RNC for this really cool site at the time called the Minnesota Independent. It's just a good kind of it's a good progressive journalism site. And and I had just quit my job at a at an alt weekly and needed something to do. And they they brought me on and I this is what I love. So I went every day to that convention. There's tons of protests. So sometimes I would just follow the police around because that was a way to write about what was happening 
I get, found my way into the convention hall at one point, whatever. It was just like adventures every day for a few days. And I loved having an intense day and then sitting down at like 7 p.m. and having to write 2,000 words about that day. Um, because it wasn't like, um, it wasn't like I interviewed a bunch of people and I have to like write a kind of straight thing. Like, but mm -hmm. I love writing a good sort of very like me meaty, not trite narrative piece. Yeah. Uh, at the end of a, at the end of a hard day. <laughs> no, and I think that can be great. Right. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like, it's just, yeah. but it's hard when like, I don't know. Um, and I always, I never minded doing like live blogs like that. It, you know, I, I, I never, love live blogs, live blogs. I always enjoyed. Um, yeah. and, and like, and like if somebody asked me like, can you do a live blog right now? I haven't done one in like six years. And I would be like, yeah, fucking put me in. Um, yeah. that's a, that's a muscle that like wouldn't go away. I think you were. So last time I was at CES, we were developing the new live blog software, uh, for Blogsmith. Mm -hmm. And it was me and Joe Bartlett and we were coding like nonstop during the days because like they were live blogging CES mm -hmm. and <laughs> it was brand new software and we were bug fixing in real oh, time. Oh, damn. That would be that would um, be really hard. Yeah, it was. But like, I think it's different because we had one thing to work on and we were yes. like heads down on that one thing and we weren't like popping from event to event and switching that's gears constantly. Exactly. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. That that I, I totally think like like it could still be stressful, but that would be fine. Like, but when you're like as because I because I used to have to go to C, like Vegas twice a year. I would go in January for CES and then I'd go in April for NAB, which is like the um uh, yeah. National Association of Broadcasters, um, which is a smaller event but a similar type of thing. And I would have to, you know, like go, yeah, from like thing to thing. And then you're trying to do like your little write ups and you're trying to get like the news out. And like in some cases, you've been able to do it in advance because you've already been pre briefed on stuff and you can just hit publish. But in other cases, yeah, they're like announcing things live. And so you're having to figure out like what's good live, like what's worthwhile. And then you're like walking the show floor and being like, oh, OK, well, should I write about this or should I write about that? And, you know, want to make sure that I'm showing enough, you know, value for me being here. Um, and I don't know. Uh, I, I'd be curious to like, the 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 big the big conferences in that way like for the the blogs and the people who do go i mean it's a lot of video people now more than websites um which is its own other nightmare i i was on camera but i didn't have to do the edits but trying to edit videos you know to go up while you're at those events is another kind of version of hell because you know people want to see it as soon as possible but if it's going to be good it's going to take more time to you know cut the whatnot so you have some people who just live stream and like great but you know if you wanted to actually look fully produced then that takes a, a lot of time and effort and you're also dealing with you know um everybody else trying to saturate the the internet that you're on um even if you bring in your own hotspots or pay for your own um wireless or or, or wired lines or whatever but um yeah um I I don't remember which year it was, but um, CES one year coincided with the Adult Video AGN. Network Awards. Yeah, they did that for a number of years. They were the same week. Um, and I got to tell you, live blogging, that was actually pretty fun. The AVN Awards, I mean, not not CES. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, I, uh, I, I never went to any of that. Instead, what would happen, it would be, you would always have, and they would always be disgusting looking and, and acting men. Who would see a woman and be like, oh, well, are you here for CES? Or are you here for the AVGN Awards or whatever? And it's like, or AVN Awards. And it's like, go fuck yourself. I'm not fucking you regardless. Like, genuinely. Yeah. Like, 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 fucking kill yourself. Um, yeah. You know, like, that, at, and, and the CES, like, I, I don't remember who it was who made them move it. But, like, there were enough complaints about that overlap that, like, they had to be moved from, yeah, to, to no longer be the same again. I don't doubt that. I don't doubt that. Yeah, because I think because I think what would happen is I think that the the adult actor film actresses I think they would get harassed too. I think they they would have like people, especially people who are from other countries who don't who have like different social norms and don't know how to act around people would like just blatantly sexually harass them. Yeah, and, well, I imagine like, I imagine that's true for adult film actresses just about everywhere they go. Well, for sure, but like there, but but if you have people who are coming for a specific event from your industry, you might still have people who are gross but you know are going to maybe have a certain kind of you know decorum, decorum. Sure. and then you have people who are like again like from parts of the world where they just don't respect women in any regard and really think that like it's okay to just 
reach out and touch people or to say things, um, even in the best of times. And uh, and then you have like, you know, like adult film actresses and it's like, huh, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe don't have these two things the same week. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. 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 Although conferences and conference groups intersecting is one of my favorite things about going to conferences. That this one's just a little messy. No, no, totally. No, look, look, if everybody can act like an adult, I'm, I'm in full agreement. Exactly, I was actually, exactly. I was actually in, I was actually in Vegas, um, I guess like three weeks ago, four weeks ago. Um, yeah, I, I, a month ago, I guess, um, for it was, again, it was supposed to be like a 24 hour thing. I wound up in that case, actually being smarter and staying a second night. So like I got in at like, 7 p.m. and we shot um the the whole next day and I thought that I was going to be leaving at like 7 p.m. the following night and uh, we had the the hotel suite for another night and I was like well if we have this this is dumb I will just stay the night and then leave at like 10 or 11 a.m. the next day which is what I wound up doing um and so I was there for like 36 hours um but um it was it was fun because we were uh, it, it was during Def, um, uh, Black Hat and DEF CON. And so, um, and I was nice. interviewing some of our security researchers and I didn't go to any of the events and I, I wasn't able to go to any of the parties, which that's okay. Um, I didn't want to get COVID or anything. So I was, that, that was fine. But we, um, me and like um, the, the guys on our, our films team were fantastic. Like we hung out, we did Top Golf and things like that. But like we went to this restaurant when we first got in and there was like this white party happening and we we didn't know like what it was for. And, and, and um, like even like the um, waitress, she was like, I'm not sure what they're all lined up for in this casino. And I was like asking, I was like, so what are you here for? They're like, oh, it's just a corporate company white party. And I was like trying to find out like what company they worked for and they wouldn't like tell me. And I was like, OK, so we were all like, OK, yeah, they must work at a cult. But that was kind of a fun thing to see because obviously there were all the security professionals there, but there were people who were in town for other things, too. And seeing like 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 to your point, Jeff, like seeing like those different types of groups in our secting um yeah, was great. was pretty funny. Yeah, I love it. I totally love it. Yeah, I had one. I was in Omaha once and at the hotel. I wasn't there for a conference, I was there for a project, but at the hotel it was like, I forget what the group was, but it was all um elderly women in um dresses made of sequins and hats with sequins, and then it was a it was a bodybuilder conference. I'm sorry, a body a bodybuilder competition. Um and so the whole, the whole like three days I was there, these were the groups that were like intersecting in the lobby and stuff. And it was just the best. It's like a world I want to live in. That's amazing. I was at one in, in June for the, the AI engineer world's fair, um, was, was at, a um, uh, the Marriott Marquis in San Francisco. Um, but the other event that was there was, I think I took a photo of it, but it was like some sewing convention. Nice. Oh, that must have been gentle, gentle people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it was, so it was like this very weird thing. Like they had like to have like the signs like showing like this direction for the AI engineer world fair, this you know direction for like the big sewing convention, and like you could not have like a more different demographic of people. Like one is like mo like almost entirely men, like in probably like their their you know twenties and thirties, um, yeah. talking you know like AI nerds, and then the other is like I would say the median age is probably fifty five, and and all women. That was pretty yeah. funny. Yeah. Oh man. Awesome. Awesome. Traveling, live blogging, weightlifters. Weightlifters. How's your mental health, Jeff? Pretty good. Good. <laughs> I've, uh, I'm fine. I, just, I can just <laughs> say, I mean, I, what, what I can say in, in short, because I've, I've talked about in the last episode and, and definitely a few episodes ago as I anticipated it or approached it, but like um, dropping my oldest off at college and then returning to a life where he is not uh, a physical presence every day. Um, one of the like just really kind of amazing experiences for me like as a parent especially recently is like i didn't really anticipate how um parenting him would be different uh, because so we have really he's a great communicator and it's very easy to talk and i've said before just like kind of like a great roommate basically but also just like a really really good kid and uh and and the way that you interact with your kids normally is like you catch them at the right moment. Maybe you have a nice conversation. They're on the couch. You're on the couch. You're driving them somewhere. They're driving you somewhere. Um, and a lot of a lot of interaction, whether it's like uh, transactional or supportive or, or, or just, you know, like really connecting happens that way. Like just kind of ships passing in uh, the day and night. Um, but when you're when you're separate, 
it's phone calls and and there's just a different um it's a different experience a different way of like receiving him and being present to him and a and kind of a, a learning curve not in a bad way at all but just like trying to like figure out what is different why does this feel different how 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 can i be the same kind of present or like whatever this new kind of present i need to be um and and you know first few weeks of college are hard and so it's been you know like a lot of sort of trying to be present and supportive and listening or whatever and it's been really awesome i i had this kind of weird realization which is like well first of all when i turned 40 i'm 49 now when i turned 40 i literally remember i was walking in omaha <laughs> probably that same trip and i remember thinking well i'm about to turn 40 that's probably it for new phases of my life i don't think there's probably going to be too many big new initiatives i don't know why i was thinking that but i really felt like it was i didn't feel it like was over life was over but yeah but i just felt like you know the thing where i jump from thing to thing or whatever and maybe there's a big left turn or whatever i was like oh it's probably done um totally not done and and i also kind of like i was thinking on that and then i was thinking about how like what I'm experiencing now feels like a, a new developmental stage, like in the terms of the sort of challenges it provides and like the, the sometimes like the struggles to recognize like, Oh, I'm in a new developmental stage. Like I am developing new ways of being in the world. And I realized that I actually have always loved entering those stages, even when they're super, super hard. And, uh, and this one isn't super, super hard, but it's, it's loaded with a lot of emotion and, and, and a lot of like wanting to, you know, maintain a connection at a time when, when your child is like in maximum new independence mode. Mm -hmm. Um, and so just figuring out like, it's a change of identity and I, and so far I, I really like it. And, and I was, did not expect that. I like the change in identity. I'd love to have them back more. I'd love to have them closer, not 11 hours away, but, um, right. Anyway, so that it, it's just. I don't know, but I think because that's on my mind all the time, I think that's the best kind of mental health check-in. And also just that it's hard when, when, when your, your kid is like, you know, on the like roller coaster of the first, I didn't go to college, but from what I understand that first semester can be hard as, it can. as, as, as can the With first year. Changes. Yeah. It's, it's so many well, changes. You're away, yeah. You're away from home for the first time. Um, for, for, for most people, it means some people have had other experiences, but for a lot of people, you're away from home for the first time. You have that yeah. first real sense of independence where. There are consequences for, you know, like no one's going to wake you up and make you go to class yeah. and yeah. you're meeting all kinds of new people who are going through the same things and um, getting really close to people really fast um, yeah. because you spend so much time together and trying to figure out who you are and getting to re reinvent yourself to some degree, you know, because it, you know, again, like it's not the same for everybody, but depending on where you go, like you might not have many of the same people from your high school there. And so, right. you know, you, you right. kind of get to try on new you know, like personalities and, and other things and be like, okay, well, I don't want to be like this anymore. I can be like this. And, and then, yeah, you know, if you, especially if you were close with your parents, like trying to figure out like, okay, well, how am I, am I still going to see them and, you know, yeah. maintain those things? Um, yeah. where is he in school? He's at, he's, well, he's just, he's at a college in Indiana. I don't know why okay. would I feel weird saying the name of the school, no, you don't have to say um, where I did. <laughs> but he's at a college in Indiana and it's, it's where his mom went and, and, um, and it's, it's a great, it's a great place. Great campus. He's very happy with all of that. But like, have you all ever been in a long distance relationship? Yes. Um, kind of. Yeah. Like, you know, that thing where if something's you're, you're, you're talking to someone and you're kind of stuck with whatever the last impression you had was on the phone. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Like pretext or whatever, or like, or even when your partner is traveling. Yeah. Yeah. Like same. Same. I was like, going to say yeah. it's yeah. like when you're traveling where like, if it's, if you have a, if you leave a call with a sense of like, I don't know what, like longing or sadness or, or if it's happiness or whatever, you sort of keep that and realize only later that like, that didn't freeze for that, that person. Like life happened in between. Right. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. M m more things happened since then. Yeah. yeah. I have to, I, I'm curious, you know, cause like when I went to college and, and I didn't go very far from home, so it was very different in a lot of regards, but you know, um, but I did have the long distance relationships and stuff, but like it was harder to keep in touch with people, you know, like yeah. we had cell phones, but we weren't texting all the time and, yeah. and you couldn't FaceTime with people you know, and, and that kind of thing. Um, do you think that like, are you able to be more connected through like other ways? Are yeah, you finding totally. that? Yeah. And, and also with that, like trying not to overdo it myself, you know, cause I, I could totally ask a question or check in every five minutes. 
Um, and so I've been, that's the other thing I've been trying to negotiate in my head, which is like, okay, what do I, right now, what do I need? And what I need right now is some kind of contact, whether it was with me even briefly, hey, I want to send you some some slippers. You need slippers with your shoe size. And it's like, tells me the shoe size. Like, that's it. Like, I, that's the minimum I need. Um, and, and but otherwise, yeah, it's nice because every once in a while, it's just a loose text. It's just a like, kind of like, hey, have you heard this album or whatever? Proof I'll get life. that or. Yeah, mm-hmm. proof of life. And, and, and so, yes, it is easier to stay in touch because you don't have to, it doesn't have to be a call. And I think, right. I think especially when as a parent, thinking of the two of us here, like when you're anxious, like one of the things I was really trying to do, we would only talk like every couple of days or do only talk every couple of days. But I was like, I don't want to, I don't want to burden him in any way with any of my anxiety. Right. Um, if he's describing something and it makes me worried or I project or whatever, like, and so if you're, if you're doing more texting and phone calling, it's a little easier to control that, to like, just, just be really like mindful of like, I don't, we're both going through our own very different thing. And right. I want us to both know that we miss each other and all of that stuff. But like, I don't want to put my like grown up ass dad anxieties onto his just freed himself into the world, <laughs> you right. know, feelings. I, I did not have to deal with this at all. I, I went to the U of M, so I was only a couple hours away from my folks, but I was yeah. so happy to get out of town. Um, I had like almost no contact with my parents for that first year of college. And my roommate, my dorm mate was my best friend from high school and really the only friend that I cared to keep in touch with. Uh, so I lived with him. My girlfriend had gone to the U of M the year before. Um, so I was basically getting out of a long-term relationship by going to college. Yeah. Right. And like everyone I needed to communicate with was there in my life. And I had like no anxiety. It was, yeah. it was so exciting to be on my own and away from what I considered a pretty oppressive environment. And totally. Yeah. It was, it was different than what you're describing. Well, and that yeah. thing too. Oh, go ahead, Christina. No, I was just going to say, but you know, um, it, but it's also like your, it's your parents react, you know, um, experience. I'm sure it was also different from Jeff's, but like it was different from what you were going through too. Right. Like I'm sure however they felt about you being gone and how you felt about being gone, like you know, I think it was a huge relief that I was gone. Yeah, there, there might have been that, right? But it's just like, but it just, you know, we remember like our perspectives. Like I, I, I'm going to be honest. Until these conversations, I've never even really thought about like what it was like for my parents. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, like it's never even really even occurred to me to be thinking about like, oh, well, how do they feel about you know us being gone? We weren't that far. Like my sister was home more often than I was, but I, you know, was 30 minutes away. And still came home some weekends to to work um and and do laundry. Um, but and, and that happened less and less. That was really only the first year. And then after that, yeah, I was like half an hour away. Um, and so it wasn't I don't know. I, I never even really kind of like anticipated like what's it like for them to not have us there. Um, I, I imagine that it was relief, but but it never really occurred to me. You know what I mean? Like it wasn't one of those, one of those things that was kind of like top of mind at all um which yeah. is interesting to kind of like you know think about be like oh yeah no um what what were they you know going through now when i moved to new york that might have been different but i'll also kind of admit at that point like i was older and whatnot and i you know haven't ever like thought too intensely about like oh you know how how, how does this make my mom feel you know well and there's i think uh, yeah right right and i know i and i didn't think about it just because i didn't go to college like i I moved out, moved into Minneapolis from the suburbs and, and was here for a long time. Then I started going to like scary places at a young age. I don't know Mm -hmm. how the fuck they dealt with that, but like, uh, but I, the other big thing, right? Like for both parents and the individual is like, did you launch or did you escape? Right. Right. Like, and I escaped, uh, not escaped like the clutches of my mother, but like escaped my life as a kid in school. Mm -hmm. And as a kid in the suburbs and all of that stuff, I escaped and I, I, I'll leave it to my son to tell, to, to know whether he launched or escaped. It feels like a launch from my end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ah, oh, yeah. Well, thanks. I thought that would be quick, but man, it's, it's definitely like the thing that's always on my mind. It's such a new, it's new. Like I, it's, I, he's 18, right? It's 18 years. He's been in my house. I mm-hmm. see him every day. 
I say good night to him. I say good morning to him. Like, you know, like well, and you're crazy. Close and you have a, and you have a good relationship, which is Super also close. which is also like different, right? Like that's not everyone's situation. Like, like, um, you know, um, I think that's but, actually a rarity. Rare. I, I think so. I mean, for, well, well, for both ends, right? Both for for parents and for the kids, right? Well, especially yeah. when. It, um, and, and I would say, cause I definitely have like some friends who are, are close with their kids, but like, um, one of my friends, like his son is a senior in high school and is going to be going to school, not that far from him, like, you know, um, in, in the same state, you know, a couple hours. Right. And so I don't know what their situation is going to be like, but they also, um, uh, he's divorced. And so he doesn't, he's not with, you know, his kids full time all the time. So I, I don't know like how much of their day to day will change, but if you're yeah. close, you know, like that's that's that that's a that's a different dynamic like i was close i'm closer with my mom now but like i was close with my parents or i guess close with my mom like i wasn't really close with my dad but wasn't not close but also i wasn't 11 hours away right like i try to yeah. imagine like what would have been like like if i had gone to new york for college right away. um right away right like it, and and had that sort of experience um i will say it was interesting because there were definitely especially once like the my my second year when i moved into my first apartment and i wasn't ever coming home to, to, to work or, or, or anything, um, because I had a, a job, um, at, at a different location and, um, didn't need to do that. Like, you know, I, I would talk to my mom like less and less, like it was, it was funny. It was like, okay, we were half an hour away, but we might only talk, you know, every other week or something, you know, it just kind of depends. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so proximity didn't play as much of a role there, but yeah, you know, cause you start to realize like, like your life, your life, like, evolves and 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 launches off but like your parents lives like they go on too right yeah, like that's yeah that's the thing is that everybody's everybody moves on um yeah and you just have to navigate okay well how much you know how do we stay in contact and and whatnot and that's not just like parental relationships that's like any sort of relationship like i had some friends and and frankly most of the relationships didn't last but like friends who didn't maybe go to college or, 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 you know, you know, kind of stuck, you know, more closer to like my hometown and whatnot. I'm like, okay, well, how often are you keeping in contact with people or even friends who went to other colleges? And, you know, yeah. it's just like, okay, well, how, how, how are we all keeping in touch? You know, are, are we, I am in one another, are we, you know, emailing, yeah. you know, are we making phone calls? Like what's, what's the deal? And like, you realize, okay, if you want to maintain these things, you have to put work into it. It won't just sustain itself. Yeah. That's another one, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And then that thing of like, I mean, this, I, I can stop to this, but the, the thing that I'm sure both of you relate to as people who went to college, um, I mean, I certainly relate to it in my own way, obviously, is that thing of like, but there's still so much you're doing for the first time. It's like your first day yeah. every day to, to borrow from John Roderick. It's like your first day, like every single day, like, um, and that's really, that's something I remember loving that. I just, I love oh, yeah. everything. I, everything I ran into, I'm like, I don't really actually know how to buy laundry soap. I love that shit. <laughs> Loved it. But anyway, <laughs> uh, so Christina, you want to, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm fine. I've been, um, like I said, I just got back from a, a day trip. I was off before that. Like I, I was back for a week, but I was, um, it took like two weeks ish off. Um, I went, um, to Atlanta to visit my family. Um, and uh, I got to see my nephew go to his first day of preschool. Speaking of first, he's three nice. years old now. And, and that, that's wild, right? Like just to see. Super like, wild. Just to see how quickly stuff passes, right? And, um, and, and my sister's been sending me photos and stuff. And so, uh, so that's been good. But uh, uh, no COVID, um, knock on wood. Um, I had to do the thing where, because I went to Las Vegas for, like I said, for that day trip. I knew that, you know, cases were really high. And I was concerned about getting my parents sick. I didn't really give a shit about if I got, you know, sick, um, because I've had COVID a few times. And at this point, um, I don't think that would be negatively impacted or whatever, but I didn't want to get anybody else sick, but it was like the worst. And I, I got my original booster like in October of last year. And I was like, I know this is the worst possible time to get a booster because the new ones are about to come out and it's like August 1st, but I'm going to go ahead and, and get one anyway. And so I got a booster August 1st and maybe that wound up being okay. Um, it sucked because then like the new ones came out like August, like 26th or something. So I was like, well, now I have to wait, you know, two months before I can get one of the new shots. But 
um, I did not get COVID. And one of our video guys did. He thinks he got it on the plane and he was only maybe knocked down for like a day or so. But that, that was good. But yeah, it was one of those things. I was like, okay, I was traveling. Um, and then I went to XOXO in Portland and then I went back to, um, uh, you know, Seattle um, and, uh, you know, kind of reconvened work. And then, I, like I said, I had a day trip this week. So I've just been kind of traveling a lot. But, um, but mental health has been pretty good. Um, no, no, no real complaints about anything other than, um, yeah, weirdly. And, and just hearing you talk about like your experiences with your son and stuff too, like watching my nephew, you know, he's three, he's only three years old, but still like seeing these kind of moments, like it makes you kind of, I don't know. I think about like my own, like not mortality, but, but you do think about just the passage of time in different ways, you know? And that's, yeah. yeah. Oh man, I'm going to be 50 in January. And I realized like, 20 years ago, I was 30. In 20 years, I'll be 70. And that sentence that I just spoke out loud goes through my head daily. (laughs) What the fuck? (laughs) Yeah, for sure. Mm. So um, should we take a sponsor break? Yeah, then can I tell my meth story? Yes. Okay. We'll do we'll we'll do sponsors first. Meth meth meth, meth after. Okay, it's not. It doesn't actually involve actual meth, but it's (laughs) it involves the topic. Okay. I mean, I have actual meth stories, but but we don't we don't have to share those now. <laughs> yeah, as I do I. But I know. that's a horrible segue. So, <laughs> um, a lot of people don't know this, but I'm going to let you in on a little secret. In my free time, I actually run a fairly large corporation, uh, somewhat shadowy, uh, with a bunch of shady contractors. And one of the things that really gets under my skin is how many of those contractors use devices and apps on my network that I can't control. And that's where this week's sponsor really saves my butt. Imagine your company's security like the quad of a college campus. Speaking of college, that would have been a good segue. It would have been. Matt um, was less of a good segue. <laughs> the, Unless that's are... the nature of your shadowy corporation. I don't know if one password has a I'm rule not allowed how... to. The space uh, between is meth and their ad on the but. down low. I can't talk about exactly what my corporation does. Got it. Um, for legal reasons. Sorry but, for getting you back in at them. So, so, so you got your your company security quad of a college campus, and there are nice brick paths between the buildings. Those are the company owned devices, IT approved apps, and managed employee identities. And then there are the paths that people actually use. Mm-hmm. The shortcuts worn through the grass that are the actual uh, straightest line from point A to point B. Those are your unmanaged devices, shadow IT apps, and non-employee identities like contractors. Shady, shady contractors. Most security tools only work on those happy brick paths, but a lot of security problems take place on the shortcuts. 1Password Extended Access Management is the first security solution that brings all of these unmanaged devices apps, and identities under your control. It ensures that every user credential is strong and protected, every device is known and healthy, and every app is visible. 1Password Extended Access Management solves the problems that traditional IAM and MDM can't. It's security for the way we work today, and it's now generally available to companies with Okta and Microsoft Entra and in beta for Google Workspace customers. Check it out at onepassword.com slash overtired. That's right. We got a custom URL. Woo-hoo. That's onepassword.com slash overtired. All right. Nice work. Thank you. That was one take. Uh, there were, for anyone listening, there were no edits in that. I'm, except for the part where Jeff started talking about meth in the middle of the <laughs> ad read. But I think they they said to make it our own. Hey. Well- <laughs> I mean, look, <laughs> Perfect. look, 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 if, if, if they're wanting to talk about the shadowy business stuff, like, how can we not make Breaking Bad references? I'm telling right you. Right on. I'm, I'm yeah. just saying. Yeah. yeah all right. Yeah, tell us. Sure. Tell, tell, all right. Now, now, now that we've done the sponsor read, um, uh, Jeff, please tell us the, your, your meth story. Do you have a friend or are you the friend who has, um, it sounds like another ad read, actually. It really does. <laughs> who is the person that retains the memories? Uh, I have a, I have, fr- I have a couple oh, of yeah, friends who, yeah, you, that's you. I believe that Absolutely. I was, I, that I would have guessed that. I have friends who remember everything. Um, uh, 
this name check Danny Glamour. I see you. My friend <laughs> Joe, who's been my my friend since um, eighth grade, he remembers we were in bands together, we toured together. He remembers everything. And um and and he told me a story back to me <laughs> recently. <laughs> That was incredible, which is that we were, a, we, we had like, like a 16 year olds, as 16 year olds, we had like a heavy metal band. We were pretty good. And we even made like a demo. We had no singer and, and we made this demo and, and the guy who recorded, it was also my drum teacher and kind of like a mentor to us. He'd been in metal bands for a very long time in, in the region, basically. And, and we needed a singer and we were ready to get out there into the world. I'm telling you, they were good songs. Okay. I still, I just re recently listened back. They were good songs for 16 year olds. Um, so we wanted a singer. We decided to put an ad in, in the alt weekly here in city pages, uh, which is now long gone. And, uh, and, and I, all I remember about and all Joe remembered about what we said, besides that we were looking for singers was that we, we said we were young. <laughs> we didn't say we were 16 and that we were, you were going to meet at my mom's house. Um, and, and we said that we had a label ready demo. That was our, that was the advice from our mentor. And, um, and, and I, I think about this and laugh so hard because we probably did seven auditions. It started with like a phone call. Um, and then, and then some fucking dude with like a mullet, um, and, and, you know, any number of like, what it was like acid wash jeans, uh, any number of kind of looks were present. They'd show up to, to jam with us and would find out when they got there that they were grown men and we were 16 and, and a couple of us were very awkward. Um, and, and, uh, anyway, so like they would say things like, well, I, I gotta say, I mean, you said you were young in the ad. I didn't realize you, you were this young. Um, there was a guy who was so nervous to sing that he asked if he could take the microphone all the way into another room <laughs> separate from us. So we're like, dude, this is not a good start. We're trying to get out there. Um, and, but anyway, <laughs> interesting so, live gigs, but there was this one dude who just wanted to hang out. And so we did like, we played and then we went upstairs into the living room. Uh, my mom was not there and we hung out on, on the couch and the, the guy told us at length how you make meth. And, and like, there's like, a, it's just like, he's preaching, doing like a sort of tutorial to these 16 year olds. None of them did meth. There was a lot of, there was a lot of pot among us not me but like among us there's a lot of acid among us but um no meth uh and and this guy just went on and on at length about how he and how we also could make meth and, I, I, and that's the somehow, story of how how you found your singer yeah that's how we found our singer man yeah i know that was a good band super <laughs> jacked up um also to say that i didn't know the story about oasis accidentally taking meth and then playing a show but you can watch it on youtube um so, what, what, what show was that? Because that could be. That it was here. Like I think it was in the States. Okay. I think I was it was in the say, States at a club. Okay. Okay. All right. I, that, that, that tracks. Cause um, I have seen the documentary about like their Wembley show, which was like one of their worst oh my God, live gigs was, ever. I just watched it recently. Yeah. 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 <laughs> which, which I actually, I think I have like, I have like the live, and then they had to make that a live recording. <laughs> it's so painful to watch. Which, which is so painful to watch, but like to see like how they were able to kind of cobble together the audio to make something somewhat passable to sell and then you look back and you're like wow and i and now now i'm, I'm gonna be a really bad oasis fan i can't remember which one fucked up i think it was i think it was liam who who fucked up who well was liam like, i mean the the thing that you can watch on youtube which is like a bunch of cuts is is and i was never an oasis fan i, I honestly got obsessed with footage for some reason after they announced they were going to reunite but it's because right. it's everywhere in my algorithm but right. now I'm just like, I'm transfixed. I'm not even that big of a fan of the music still, but I'm transfixed. And it's the one that I'm thinking of a Wembley is like, Liam Gallagher is singing, not the real lyrics to the songs. Yes, yes, He's yes, He's pausing yes, yes. to say things like, does anybody want some lasagna? No, exactly, uh, exactly, ex ex exactly. Fucking Wembley? No, no, it's no incredible. He, he, he was like purposely like drunk and angry. Like they'd gotten in a yeah. fight. And and like the second night, he knew that this that you know they were going to have to be making like it, it they had all the recording stuff there like they knew this was going to be the live album and and he's just like fuck it let's do it and like in retro and and years later I think he'd apologized but Noel was just like beside himself he's just like okay I'm ready to go right I'm ready to leave and and Liam's like oh what do you mean we're leaving now and it's like Noel is just like done mind you you know mind you it's at Wembley yeah it's no Wembley. it's amazing. I, I have to say, like, I am transfixed by those two. I think I, so I'm confused. Christina, are you a good person to ask some Oasis questions? I can be brief, Brett. Yeah, yeah, I was, yeah, yeah. Until two weeks ago, I didn't give a shit about Oasis, but all mm -hmm. of a sudden I'm obsessed. 
I was under the impression that Liam was the asshole, the bigger asshole. But now I'm starting to understand that maybe Noel is the bigger asshole. Are they they're, both they're, just big assholes? They are. They are. That that would be in like, ways that are kind of delightful. Yes, one thousand yeah. percent. I mean, which is why I'm going to spend so much money. I tried to get tickets for the uh, reunion tour and oh, um, yeah. failed. And I'm going to spend so much money. Like it'll it'll still be less than Taylor Swift money. Let's be fucking for real. But like I'm going to spend so much money on trying to get Oasis um, uh, tickets because the thing is, is like, I feel like I have to go to like one of the first shows in the UK because I have, it, it, it'd be like buying uh, tickets to, um, you know, the Fuji's reunion, which they've canceled. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Like you, you can't buy tickets to any Lauren Hill concert and expect to actually be able to go to that concert. Like that's not happening. Like there's a 95% chance, probably actually a 99% chance that Lauren Hill will not show up. Like that's just how it works. And I feel that like sounds Oasis, like the Oasis show a little bit. And, and, and that I was going to say Oasis to me, like feels similar. It's like, okay, you have to like buy these tickets, like with the assumption, like even with, you know, getting them from scalpers or whatnot, which is like, you're just going to have to go to London for a completely different, you know, go to the UK for a completely different purpose and be okay with it because there's a very, very good chance that these two brothers will just absolutely refuse to go on stage with one another. Or that show might be five minutes long. Right. Yeah. But well, well, that that I, I think would be less likely. I think that like if they can actually get on there, like they even did the full, you know, Familiar's Millions uh, like show. That was the, that Wembley thing. Like they, you know, did the full show, both dates. Um, like it was bad and they had to do a lot of overdubbing, but like they did the full thing. Um, and honestly, in if you were there in the year 2000, you probably would have been pissed off. But in retrospect, you'd probably be like, Fuck yeah, I got to witness that tr shit show like in person. Um, I've only seen it's them super live. 90s. Yeah, I've I don't even know if that was in the 90s. It but was. It was. It, it, was it, it, it was. It was. It was in um, 2000, which actually okay. I saw that tour. Um, I saw them at Music Midtown in Atlanta, uh, I guess, in like May of 2000. And I was I mean, I, I liked Oasis like everybody liked Oasis, um, you know, like definitely at least like where I grew up we shaking his head. I was well, indifferent. <laughs> well, well, I, I just mean like in my group of, of, of people, right? Yeah, like, for I was sure. definitely like, like where I grew up, we were definitely. Everybody liked Oasis. That's a fair statement. You know what I mean? Like, like <laughs> yeah. everybody, everybody had, you know, what's the story, Morning and Glory. Like everyone had that album. Like it, the Blur versus Oasis, like Van Wars, at least in like the South, at least where I grew up, it was not even a competition. It was like Blur had one song and like everybody knew like every. Pop live. Song. Yeah. And, and so, um, I mean, I liked Radiohead best out of all of them, but like, you know, I was definitely team Oasis versus team Blur. But the thing that shaped, shaped it for me and like the reason that, um, was I saw them perform, like I said, at Music Midtown, like they ended like night one and I was kind of indifferent about even sticking around to see them. Like I was there for like the bands that I was really into at the time, like terrible in, in comparison bands to be completely candid with you, like, like Collective Soul. And, and I'm like 16 <laughs> years old. And yeah, yeah. and and I, saw, and and I saw Oasis do their live set, and it was to this day like here we are like like almost twenty five years later like one of the best things I've ever seen like, and I don't know and and I know that, that tour was hard for them so I don't even and I don't know what their you know situation was with one another and they were you know performing at like this festival in fucking Atlanta like downtown Atlanta and they like or Midtown really and like killed it were so incredibly good that i was like well fuck i guess i'm i guess i'm an oasis fan now right like i had i had, I had that's a similar... what's happening to me yeah that's happening to me through youtube now except i yeah. still can't listen to an album i don't know what the deal is but i could watch that guy press his upper lip to that sure beta 58 all day long <laughs> so as a segue into um some gratitude First, I want to give Christina a heads up that I did actually talk about yours last week, but you're okay. welcome to repeat it if, okay. if you think you have new things to say. Oh, well, no. Okay, um, well, if you, if you talk about mine, then then I, I will just once again say Moon 4, great, but that's uh, I'll find another I, one. I preempted you. I'm sorry. No, that's fine. Um, but speaking of accidentally doing meth, um, I am realizing in real time that I accidentally took a double dose of Vivance today. Oh no. um, God! Which I've been has there. me, which has me pretty fucking edgy right now. Yes, <laughs> um, it's not a good feeling. Like I have, it's a terrible. I have abused feeling. plenty of drugs in my life, but I am, I am way past one. I'm sorry, like Brett. This. I've done that, and it was not okay. It's not yeah. okay. It's not. Yeah, okay. I, it's not cool. Yeah, I've definitely. Yeah, I, people don't realize. Yeah, the on that. Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. Go on. 
No, it's okay. I, my my other thing was like Christina spends exorbitant amounts on getting to cool concerts, and like that's that's important to her. And I want to admit that I spent a crazy amount of money upgrading my flights to Vegas to first class. Hell yeah! Um, because a three hour flight in 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 what now passes for economy, it, where my yeah. knees oh, yeah. touch oh, the yeah. seat in front yeah. of me. Totally. Um, just is so much hell to me that it's worth a fair sum of money to fly first class. So on my way home, I could not get the upgrade for the three hour part of the trip. Um, and like so I am going to spend three hours in economy and it's going to be a shitty way to end the trip. But the the rest of my flights, four, four other flights are all. So you're not able. Class. So you're not able to do it direct. You can't go Minneapolis to Vegas. No, that sucks. Um, I go lacrosse to Chicago to Vegas, and then Vegas to La Chicago to lacrosse. And uh, I, I have three hour overlays at O'Hare, uh, which isn't so bad. That's a um, great. That's a great airport. I have stuck I have day from, passes to like the American Airlines. Yeah, I was going to say. What they call it? Lin embassy? No. Admiral, Admiral, Admiral Lounge. Admiral Lounge. Lounges. Yeah. We've talked about lounges. Changed my life. Oh, yeah. No, yep. this is the greatest thing ever. Like, I have, like, the Platinum American Express card, like, specifically oh. for that reason. Um, if you can find, like, places that have Centurion lounges, that's great. But even just, like, Priority Pass stuff. Wait, what lounges? The, uh, the, the American Express Centurion lounges. Oh. They're not I... at every airport. But the ones wow. they are at, they're incredibly nice. You know what else the metal American Express cards are great for? This is more for Brett and me probably is ice scraping your, your window. It's a, mm. I keep I keep an expired one that I oh, use yeah, just no, to scrape. I, I've, heard, I've heard that from people. Yeah, that is definitely like a you thing. Like we do not have that in, in, um, in Washington have, State. Need to take advantage of that? Not at all. But I have actually seen people like on like the Amex like subreddit like do that sort of thing <laughs> with the metal cards, which is funny. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. All right. Um, I, I'll kick off the gratitude because this one has been a long time coming. Um, oh, I, yeah. as, of, as of this week, have made the switch from Sublime Text to VS Code. Oh, fuck. And oh, fuck yes, finally. Uh, oh. VS oh, Code is so much better than I thought it was. Yeah, it is. Um, especially with Copilot. Yes. Copilot fucking blows me away. Like I type the first two letters of like a comment for a function mm -hmm. and it like knows exactly and it it does everything. It's and it's almost always right. Like at, I'm like I'm working on some SAS for a, a redesign of my website and I type a dollar sign and it knows what it variable knows. I want to fill in. Uh, I, I put in like a font face definition and then I move down a line and type a net symbol and it just figures out what font files are in my folder and creates all the font face definitions for all of them. I can turn a Ruby comment. I can just write a comment about what I want a function to do and it'll write a perfect, and, and not just a function based on an LLM, it's a function based on all of the other files in my project. Um, and it can reference variables and methods from other files and it's just shit sublime will never do no um and it is and uh, it's taking a little bit of getting used to with uh setting up key combinations mm -hmm. and everything um and there's some frustration around keyboard shortcuts uh especially when they overlap and yeah uh, but i'm figuring it out and the configuration is pretty easy compared to sublime like the like the graphical interface for because you can view your your config as JSON or as exactly as an example. interface, yes. and and sometimes you have to open up JSON to yes. add custom features and whatnot. But all that said, um, it is a really solid editor, and I am really enjoying it. I'm so glad to hear that you finally like moved because I know because it's one of those things like it's hard to make the move. Like I um, mm -hmm. I did it because I I, I worked at Microsoft at the time and, and um, know and still know, frankly, a lot of people who work on that team. And, and I know a lot of people who work on the Copilot extensions. So I'm very glad to hear your feedback on that. If you have other feedback, positive or negative, please let me know and I can 
get that to the right folks. I have like zero negative feedback. I am just constantly blown away by how good it is. No, they do such a good job and, and, and really like keep making that so much better um, with so many constraints and uh, um, extensions, which are in um, uh, preview right now, but will be coming later. Um, although, well, there are two types of extensions, but there are copilot extensions um, that can exist in VS Code so that certain, you know, you can use the, um, the agents feature to basically ask an extension in chat, various things that powered by copilot. I don't know if you've played around with that or not. Like some of the built-in yeah. ones are like at workspace and at terminal and, and at VS Code, but other extensions can add those things too, which is really cool because then in your chat interface, you can just ask specific things about a certain extension um, or service um, as the case may be, which is really fucking useful. But like, no, I know how hard it is to go from like, you know, one editor to another, even if you know there are a lot of advantages around. And even if you know, like, you know, in my case, it was TextMate. And it was like, this is never getting updated again. Like, this is this is dead in the water. But it's hard to like move editors. Mm -hmm. And uh, but, but I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that you are enjoying VS Code. Um, if you come up with like, uh, I would be interested to see at some point, like your, your um, key bindings and, and settings files. That's one of the things they've improved a lot over the last few years. Like at first, you used to have to only, you could only edit settings in the, the JSON. And then they started adding the graphical interface. And most things are there, but not everything is. Right. Um, Brent likes to keep his key bindings to himself. <laughs> well, I would <laughs> just like... No, I take that back. I take that back. He wrote War and Peace, but it was key bindings. <laughs> right. Exactly. Sorry, exactly. Ahead, Christina. No, no. I was going to say that one of the things that, and, and this is improved over the years, but I remember when they introduced this, I don't know, probably four years ago, maybe longer than that at this point, but the the concept of having like profiles that you can sync and different types of, of profiles and, and like pre kind of defined environment setups, I love because yeah. I can have, I have like a, I have one that I have just for writing, but I also have one that is basically like for demos or for workshops or whatnot. It won't have any of my pre-configured stuff that's, you know, basically mm -hmm. kind of as, as close to like an out-of-the-box experience as possible. Yeah. Well, um, and I set up a profile just for like testing extensions. Exactly. My oh, first nice. time I tried VS Code, I just installed like everything, everything. that looked interesting. Classic. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. pretty soon I had and no like idea what, what was doing what. Exactly. And it was a huge mess. It's so like, now it's like I the have a profile just for uh, fucking around with them. Exactly. It's like, it, the, it's like the raiding the store in Red Dawn. Uh, no, totally. Like, I'll take a sleeping bag. I'll take six arrows. I'll take so that bullet. The only complaint I've run into is the markdown uh, packages that are available mm -hmm. are not up to snuff for me. Well, you're yeah, right. I, um, have, I, I, have some, I have some issues with that too. And so I want to. I want to port Markdown Editing, which is a package I built for Sublime, and then it switched to another maintainer who continued to extend it. And it's all in Python, and I've never written an extension for VS Code, but I am interested in porting, because it's pretty it's pretty basic text editing stuff that just yeah. makes Markdown life easier. I would love this so much, Brett. I would too. Yeah, I would like too, the, the magic the... links and magic footnotes I miss. But... Yeah, like that I would love because like because that's the thing. Like there's like the Markdown all in one package. There's some other things yeah. like some some um, people have even put together some like collections of um uh you know extensions that you could install mm -hmm. all together. Like some of the GitHub um, documentation people have done that, and some of that's good. But yeah, I run into some things there too. So. Selfishly, this excites me that you are interested because if you're able to work on porting, I'm sure we can find people to, to help with that and whatnot. But um, also writing extensions for VS Code is, is pretty um, uh, straightforward. And they, you know, um, borrowed a lot of things from Sublime and, and TextMate in the early days, which have still kind of continued onward well, so yeah the there's a yeoman generator for making yep. extensions yep. and it is it's it's that's something that sublime has never had and like something to like uh scaffold out a plug-in exactly. that's pretty cool but yeah yeah they did that early on i think that's one of the reasons to be candid like why like it took off the way that it did was that they really put a lot into from the very beginning mean like okay we know this is only going to work if the extension community shows up. Right. Well, yeah. And we've talked before about how vital um, uh, a community is to an app. Mm -hmm. um, and if you want an app to reach any level of general acceptance, at least in the nerd world. Yes. Like you need to some extent extensibility, but more importantly, you need a community. Totally. And that's something like Obsidian has done really Obsidian well. Obsidian has done so well. Code. 
Taxmate did like Tech Taxmate Mate was, was to me the gold standard. That was so or, fun. Like, that was so fun. Building out a community and totally showing was. what what an app could do. Yeah. If it had a community. And and that was really impressive because that was really before GitHub. Like obviously GitHub happened when TextMate was still, you know, popular, but it, like the early stuff didn't even have GitHub yet, right? Like people were, you know, sourcing or hosting things other ways and like people built you know, kind of like ways to view extensions, if I recall correctly, like there were like mm. plugins that you could install so you could view other extensions from other places, right? Right, that's like, right. Like, you know, yep. kind of kind of bringing in their own app stores and whatnot. And like that, I think kind of set like the tone where you're like, okay, if anybody else is going to, this is table stakes now, right? And I think Sublime did an okay job at first. And then I really just think that they just dropped the ball. Um, that's one of the reasons why I never well, it's really just seemed kind of stagnant for a while now. It has, right? Like the the package control ecosystem that was built for Sublime um, was it was great. Like for finding extensions, for sharing extensions, yeah. like it was great. But I just uh, like I have an RSS feed from package control, and mostly what's coming through now is just new themes. And honestly. There only need to be so many text editor themes. Yeah. Right. I mean, you're basically working essentially with 16 colors. Yeah. I mean, you, you can make it. There are only so many combinations. Scheme. Yeah. Like you've got, you've got your, your solarized combinations. You got your base 16 combinations and you got like, um, uh, like the Monokai variations. And after that, like, what are you even doing? No, it's true. It's true. What's actually really funny is that still to this day, like the the GitHub repo that I have that has like the most like stars and other things from it is a a, a TextMate theme repo um, that's like that I like created like in like oh in Twilight from Text. Yes, you need Twilight. You need yeah. Twilight. Yeah, and so and people still download this and stuff, and it's like you know close to fifteen years old. Um, well, that, that I've had TM this collection. Theme TM that format, theme files work on every editor. Well, I was going to say, like, that's the thing. It became the, like, just kind of generic uh, format, which is fantastic. Um, yeah. And people have made better ones since then. But it was funny. I created, like, this repo. I think I did it for a, a Mashable article. And I'd had a GitHub account, but I hadn't done anything with it. And I was like, well, I just need a way to distribute and show off these themes. And I even, like, people have asked me over the years, they're like, can you put licensing in this? I'm like, sure can't, because I don't know where a lot of this stuff came from, because <laughs> I just found things from various <laughs> servers and other things. Like uh, many of them, it's funny, it's like added from slash user slash Christina slash textmate dash themes, right? right? Like a lot of these things were like, you know. And and none of these are mine, so I can't license them for I can't you. license them for you, right? I was like, I, was like I, can, I can do all kinds of other, you know, I, I can, if, if there's anything in the readme file on that thing, you know, that points to a person, I can give them credit, but like, I was very explicit. I was like, a collection of TextMate themes I've gathered over the years. People are like, what's the license? And I'm like, good luck, right? Like this is this is just kind of a, a you know, share and 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 do go with God sort of thing. Don't use this. I'm not telling anybody to use this commercially because I think some people, it's funny, people have created like um, TM theme like editors and many mm -hmm. of them, they pull in frankly from this repo you know, it's kind of like the, the kind of default themes to play with mm -hmm. and modify. And so for something like that, I could understand. We were like, oh, it would be good to have a license around this. And I'm like, yeah, I'm I'm definitely not. The, good luck. Uh, so, I don't think it'll be a problem, but I wouldn't use this commercially. Side note, I a, a while back, I decided to start using light themes in my text editor. And I'm still dark theme and terminal. Mm -hmm. um, but I almost can't edit code have you ever tried switching from light to yes. dark themes? Yes. Like yeah. It, whatever you're used to at the time, it's really hard to see it inverted. Um, so for a long time, every time I looked at a light theme, it just looked wrong. Um, and I decided for the sake of my eyes to force myself to make the switch. Uh, and I made my own light theme called Lucky Charms. Oh, nice. That I installed in like uh, in Vim and in uh, Sublime and now in VS Code. And I've actually gotten bored with it. And the snazzy light. Snazzy light is really good. That comes with VS Code is is what I'm using right now. Um, but like it's weird to me that people default to editing in dark mode. Um I find that so strenuous on my eyes. Um, and if I'm looking at pages and pages of code, I absolutely, I'm a light theme guy now. 
Yeah, I go back and forth. Sometimes I am light. Um, I've been um, kind of probably a variant of a dark theme for most of my, you know, time in text editors, but I sometimes will use the light. I will say the one time I always use a light theme and snazzy light is good. The GitHub light is, is another good one um, is uh, when I'm presenting because mm. um, dark themes um, when you're using any sort of like, like projector uh, system, you know, or, or, or whatnot, like to, to large audiences, oftentimes the, the, the bulbs and those things aren't like frankly bright enough to really illuminate dark um, uh, backgrounds. And people don't think about that when they give presentations, but if you, especially if you're like in a big crowd, depending on, you know, just like quality of the screen that you're on and, and, and all kinds of other things, like it can be really hard to see the text on screen. And so, um, I, that was like, uh, feedback that was given to me like years and years ago, uh, when I first started doing, um, conference talks and they're like, no use, like, it was almost like a rule. Like we use, you know, light themed for, you know, uh, text in, in our presentations. And I was like, okay, but that, I, I like how dark looks better. And then you realize, oh, okay, but inside a room, especially with various lighting things and whatnot, actually light is a lot better for that. And so um, that's made me more open to, you know, just depends, right? Like my eyes don't bother me using dark things for the most part, but sometimes, sometimes it can. But I, I do draw the line, like, again, unless I'm in a presentation and then I might switch it. I can't use a, a light editor for a terminal. I just can't. Like it, oh, yeah. it, it, like no, it feels it's gross. It's weird. It's weird how different that is. Um, and I don't know oh, what yeah. the distinction is, but I've tried light themes in terminal. Because we've been looking at dark terminals since war games. Maybe, yeah. Maybe. Yeah. And I will say this though, with like, especially depending on like what uh, machine I'm on. So like when I'm on my um, like iMac or like my 27 inch um, uh, studio display, like my terminal um, text size is a lot larger than the text size is on my text editor. And I don't uh, know if that has anything to do with it, right? Like I use I use un, uncommonly large text sizes too. And it's not just for my eyes. My brain just works better. Maybe seeing less on the screen at once, uh, which is the side effect of using a larger font. But yeah, no, I, I can like see that. 14, I use like 14 point fonts in terminal. Yeah, I use I use 16 um for uh for terminal and i probably use like you know 12 um on um oh i do the inverse stuff. i use 16 in my text editor and 14 12 in ter or 14 in terminal i guess but yeah yeah anyway uh so that's my pick for the week i just used up like 20 minutes no that's great the vs code and and um do you, are you do you have any plans like as you start to play around with it more do you think you might you know dip into wanting to either share like your config files or extensions or anything like that like oh absolutely i i i intend to get into writing extensions um yeah i my last couple uh forays i wrote an obsidian extension mm -hmm. and tried to get it submitted to the repo and it was a pretty basic extension and they i did i made all the changes they requested on the pr and then they let it die and they kept sending me emails. If this doesn't get, uh, if, if this, if there's no activity on this PR for the next 30 days, we're going to close it out. And I, I kept bumping it. I'm like, it's done. Could you, right. you know, merge the PR? And they just, they never responded and it died. That's um, so I'm hoping if I get into developing is, extensions for yeah, VS Code, it'll go better. It will. It All will. Right. I mean, at that point, like, I think it is literally just something like to get listed, like in the um, marketplace is a very simple thing. Like, I, I, I don't even know what the approval process is. I, ostensibly, there's one, but I, I don't think it's super <laughs> uh, strict. Um, and, uh, and, it, you know, you can just, it, there's a way to do it directly from from GitHub. Um, because it, on those pages, they go to like, you know, usually the, the source link is a GitHub link. And so yeah, yep. it, it's it's a relatively easy process. And that also makes right. it easy to push out updates and stuff too, because then the release notes, like anything in your readme from your GitHub, like kind of shows up um, as, as the release cool. notes or other things in the extensions. So cool, cool, cool. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. I got one. Yeah. Go for it. All right. Here's the scenario. Every day I, I open up Firefox, I use containers, mm -hmm. uh, and because right. I have, for many reasons, but I have to open up four different Google accounts for work, like my mm -hmm. personal account, my personal work account, our admin account, and then another uh, just account related to the business. 
And, um, and every day I, I, I mean, not every day I can, they can save, but I actually don't like seeing these tabs when I'm not working. So I tend to kill them, even if they, you know, like I pin them and then I kill them. But, uh, basically like every day I like open up, I, the keyboard show, open up my container for personal, my container for work, for admin. And then I open up two of those windows and I hit drive in one and Gmail in the other. So that like, by the time I'm done, I've got drive for each of those accounts open. I've got Gmail open and, and it's so fucking tedious and it seems crazy that I can't automate that better um but i i, I was on setup sometimes i go on setup and i browse which isn't always a, a great experience because there are just some stinkers on there Absolutely. and some stuff that just hasn't been updated in a while and it's not you can tell you you can go and look but it's not immediately obvious um and uh so anyway i i stumbled into this thing called keysmith which is just it just records macros of what you're doing on your screen it's similar to something keyboard maestro can do except that going into keyboard maestro is like going into an art museum where everything's eight and a half by 11 and all <laughs> frames are touching um and and it was beautiful so i just like i instantly opened up this app and i had it record doing this thing where i opened these different containers enter gmail enter drive it did it beautifully added a keyboard shortcut it was it took me about three minutes i had to do just a little bit you can go in and correct your macros like anything else that is a macro it took me about three minutes so elegant so great uh and and i love it and and the app is like um and it can do a lot more than that but that's how i'm using it it the app was like a covid baby uh came out in like august 2020 it's kind of adorable it's my two friends are both named daniel and they've been friends since kindergarten um and it hasn't had like a serious update since like maybe 2021 but they they keep it like lightly updated it you know when there's a new os there's a new version um and there's you know occasional bug fixes so, like they seem to be paying attention to it uh and it hasn't been buggy for me at all and i love it it's like uh it's if you get it on setup you just get it on setup if you purchase it you can do like a free li license where you get like up to five macros or you can um you can purchase like a single license for 54 bucks it actually looks like it's just a permanent like a forever license um Anyway, I was like so delighted to find this because there are various things I do over the course of the day, various admin things with just like a lot of times it's just shitty apps that, you know, you should not have to click this much and they're not easy to automate. You could do it in Keyboard Maestro, but again, I love Keyboard Maestro. God, I sound like Trump. I love Keyboard Maestro. Um, but, a lot. Uh, but it's a lot of much. people are saying a lot of people are saying a lot of people are saying it's too much. A lot, a lot of people are saying, um, yeah. That's my first attempt at a Trump uh, impression. Not not great, uh, but that's all right. I did the hands. You can't see it, but I did the hands okay, like the accordion. Um, anyway, so that's <laughs> the, the Obama speech at the DNC. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, eh, eh. so anyway, that was uh, that. That's mine, and I'm I'm so excited about it. And I only discovered it yesterday, and so I'm gonna play a bunch. Yeah, I've actually played with that before. Um, it felt like adding one more thing to an already crowded automation setup for me. Yeah. Uh, but it was, it was, uh, I think I, I think I passed on it because it was, um, simpler, um, conceptually than keyboard maestro and it felt redundant. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. not that I was doing a lot of macro recording in keyboard maestro. It just felt like if I was going to get into that, I already own keyboard maestro and, but no, that my, that review is, problem, is tempting. My my issue with going into keyboard maestro, and this is not a problem. This is actually the the great thing about keyboard maestro. But like, I totally go into terpster mode where it's like, well, I could do this, but I could also mm -hmm. do this, and if I'm doing this, I could also do this, and then I'm pretty soon it's like, well, fuck, uh, I I had a deadline an hour ago, um, and and so with this one, it's I always need like. I need the like automation app, like keyboard maestro, where you could just like go in and you could go deep. And then I need the thing that's like, I'm panicking. I can't think straight. I'm having a right. nervous reaction to having to do this thing over and over. I need to fix it quick. And this is the, this is a great little thing in the toolbox for that. Did you ever see oh, my wait. markdown nope. document linker for keyboard maestro? That was the result of going into keyboard maestro and just realizing I could do something. Yeah. And then yeah, spending I remember this. two remember hours this. doing something like, you, yeah, yeah, you give exactly. It, you give it like a root directory for like a Jekyll site, for example. Um, and as you're writing, you can just type slash slash LNK and it'll pop up like a Quicksilver style menu of all of the documents in your markdown directory. And you can 
use fuzzy search to find one and that it'll insert like a liquid format or a markdown format link to that document for like intra document linking. You know what? Um, you know what just occurred to me? I bet you I bet you sound like that when you talk in your sleep, but you just did. <laughs> <laughs> and I do talk in my sleep. I laugh in my sleep. I sing in my sleep. Um, Elle finds it very endearing because That's they good. don't have to share a bed with me. Okay. Like yeah. separate bedrooms. So just occasionally she'll hear like singing <laughs> coming. <laughs> Park life. And and I'm laughing. I'll wake myself up laughing regularly. But anyway, Christina, would you uh would you land on? Okay, so since Brett mentioned a moon last week, and I'm sorry that I missed that one, but uh, uh, I will just co-sign that. Um, and uh, yes. I, I upgraded um, that um, recently, and I was super excited about it. I'd missed the announcement, and I, I saw it, I think, maybe like the day that the upgrade price like changed, but that was fine with me. I'm still happy to, to upgrade. It's a really good app. Um, speaking of uh, kind of apps where there are some things that um, you could do with other apps, including um, things like LaunchBar or Alfred or whatnot, but um, there are other things that I think are just really unique to this. Uh, we've talked about this one before, but a, a new 6.1 version uh, just came out and adding Sequoia compatibility. Uh, and this is a default folder X. This is also available on um, uh, setup, although I have also, this is one of those ones that I've like purchased like a direct yeah, license. Yeah. And then I use the setup version because Brett, you've said you've indicated Same. before that that like it it helps out the developer more. Yep. Um, if, if you use the setup version um, frequently, then they'll get a higher payment. But it was also one of these apps that is important enough to me that I've gotten enough value out of over the years that I was like, I'm going to buy it and use it as part mm -hmm. of my subscription. Same. To be clear, yeah. I don't think I'm not saying that that's something that everybody needs to do. Like that's a, a you know, Christina quirk. But default Flutter X is, is one of my favorite apps um it if you've never used it it kind of takes over the the, the uh, you know save as um uh i guess screen on your mac dialogue. and uh, it, yeah exactly, the dialogue thank you and and adds in um a, additional chrome where you can um access more features like you know uh, a specific set of folders or, or or um favorite folders or you can automatically say you know for this recent type of folders recent yeah for this yeah. for this type of you know file in this application i always wanted to go here regardless of what the most recent thing was like this is where i always wanted to open um i also have like um a keyboard short uh, uh, um uh, key bindings um within finder where i can hit a, a certain combination and it'll take me immediately to a, a certain folder and i know i could do that in any number of apps but i i use it with the default folder x because i have some folders that are just always um, a favor that I always want easy access to. And they've, um, they've also just re released a, a kind of a new feature to be able to do, um, I guess like a quick, uh, quick access, um, to, to files, like a cross app, something you could do in an Alfred or launch bar, or if you want to access, you know, certain uh, URLs or certain, um, um, other, uh, stuff you, you can do that, uh, from kind of a, a, a quick link, um, a key, key binding shortcut. Like a, uh... Oh, cause they have, there's like a quick search yeah. where it pops up like a, um, like a launch bar style window and exactly. I've never used that. I've used it a little bit and they just, they added some, some new th things with that. Like, so, um, you can, um, it, now I guess one of the new things that quick search can be used to open like web URLs that are saved in your favorites. Hmm. So that is kind of interesting. Yeah. Like if you have another solution for that, like I'm not saying that, that you necessarily need to use uh, default folder X's, um, in, in it, in replacement of that, but there are some things that you can do that are cool. And if you don't have an app kind of set to do those things, I think it's a, it's a, it's a nice little variant, but just, just for me, like, this is just a, um, the, the version six came out. I'm not sure when, um, it was either uh, earlier this year or sometime last year, but it's good. But 6.1 is going, you know, came out with Sequoia support and, and some other things. And I don't know, um, it's a really, really good app, really, really good developer. And so uh big fan. I've uh, I've said this before, but and I use default folder X all the time, but my favorite feature is when you're in an open or save dialogue and you open up the parent folder, mm -hmm. for, it adds arrows. Yes. And you can jump quickly to subfolders yes. and parent folders. 
Mm -hmm. um, just from one simple tree and you don't have to navigate folder to folder. Yes. You can just jump around and you can jump up to parent directories and into a subdirectory of a parent directory all without with just one click and, you know, some hovering. But um, I, I absolutely adore that feature. Can I tell you how I actually navigate directories now? Yes, please. please. So in my terminal, I use a variation of something that used to be called bash marks. Um, and the way that mine functions is it, I have a folder called dot marks and it creates symlinks to anything that I bookmark. So all of my frequently used folders have bookmarks and I can type because I've, I've written my own CD command, but mm -hmm. I type CD and then any part of a bookmark name hit tab and it jumps to that folder. Oh. And then I have an alias CDF that opens the current terminal folder in Finder. So when I want to navigate into like the image directory for my blog, I yep. type CDO, which is for some reason the shortcut for my blog, CDO, and then I just type images. And it will find that subdirectory of the parent bookmark. And then I just type CDF and, I'm, and I have it in fire. Nice. That's awesome. I, That's it's so like, it's so easy to add new bookmarks and to navigate subdirectories of those bookmarks using my fuzzy CD command that really there's no default folder X even. It, it's just, it's so easy. <laughs> hey, do you use the, do you ever use the terminal in VS Code? Now that you're using VS Code? I do, yeah, yeah. I have. I really like that. I also enjoy the SSH remote config. Mm -hmm. um, and I can I can load up an Oracle Cloud. Uh, I can load up a GitHub repository connected to an Oracle Cloud instance all in one term, all in one VS Code window and edit files remotely in a cloud machine. Amazing. And execute cloud platform um, apps like spin up Pulumi and everything mm -hmm. inside of a VS code window. And every, it's so integrated. It's super nice. Awesome. Very cool. All right. We did it. We I have to it. go pick up L. So we should wrap up. Yeah. All right. It's, we're like an hour and 20 in. Hey, look, all it's right. been a while since we've all been together. So. That's right. All right. Well, we all seem to be sleeping okay, at least as of last night. Um, <laughs> but I think we could all use more. We could use more for sure. And and, and I hope you figure out uh, things, uh, Brett, whether you're going manic or not. I know we didn't have a lot of time to talk about that, but because it's been a while since you've had, had a manic episode, hasn't it? Um, it's this might be a topic for next week. Yeah, well, we, we, yeah, we, like, we can I think, pause on it for I sure. I think my definition of manic episode might be changing. Okay. Ah, um, super it's interested. It's no in longer like five days with no sleep. Now it's like three months with like less sleep and, and like less obsession, but still like up from mm -hmm. my normal elevated mood i guess but anyway I'll... it sounds like it sounds like the common thread is i bet that it's evident in your github action uh, <laughs> yeah yeah if as we, always we can yeah. go we can go track that um, all right you guys right. get some get sleep. sleep get yeah. some sleep